In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, in thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, amen. Uh, I've lost slides. And they are. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faith, and kindle in the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Now shall we be the face of the earth. Let us pray, O oh God, instruct the hearts of thy faithful. By the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same spirit of right judgment all things. 
never rejoice in his consolation. That's our Lord. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have an emergency announcement about the treats. No, I just wanted to comment that our treats going forward are sign up as treats of ours, but today we only have one person to sign up, Ginger back there, and <laughs> anyway, if you want to sign up, the list is on the wall. Right there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is lit. That doesn't mean you have to stop providing treats. <laughs> All right. Uh, I wanted to mention, by the way, this is the, this is not the cathedral. This is not the bishop's chair. It's the teacher's chair and it wasn't here and I'll fall over if I don't have something to sit, sit on. Well, now, I'm, now I'm completely out of the picture for the people at home, that's okay. All right, um, I wanted to start by mentioning again, a, a wonderful thing that, that transpired in our parish last weekend. And that was Father DeSalle's homily at the 9.30 mass. I don't know what he did, he, he had other masses, but I've heard him give the, the presentation on the church, on the mass. Uh, it usually takes him two and a half hours to do it. Uh, C, RCI is an hour and a half. Actually, it's an hour now, so seven, seven to eight. And, and he usually takes two hours and a quarter, two hours and a half. And even then he doesn't get through all that he wants to talk about. And he gave a five week series on the mass uh, that's on the internet a few years ago at, I think at Easter in Lent. And his long talk, his two hour talk is on the internet. So I commend it to you. But suddenly he gave one of the most incredible condensed versions of that two hour presentations I've ever heard um, in order to tie it into the transfiguration. And the fact that Peter didn't know what else to say after they had fallen asleep in the presence of the two greatest Old Testament figures in the world in Jesus, uh, as Father mentioned, you uh, some often do fall asleep at mass and it's unfortunate because there's a lot going on that you're not aware of. But anyway, he gave this wonderful homily and I uh, commend it to you and I hope it'll be put up on the line, but lo and behold, uh, I've talked about this before and I was gonna try to switch over to show it to you, but there's a program called the Catholic Thing that's produced by, um, Robert Royal, who's a member of our parish, and he's a very scholarly gentleman. He really has great, I think he's a theologian, scholar, and he's put this together to bring uh, a, to everyone free of charge through the internet on a daily basis, a very scholarly little two-page paper. And they're, by all di they're all different topics, they're all over the place, but I've, but, but I've seen them from Father Scalia often, seen from Father Pekorsky. Then there's some other quite renowned uh, Catholic writers that people christened them. And lo and behold, this week, here's Father DeSalle's homily in two pages. It's amazing. And it's called, It's Good for Us to Be Here, which is what Peter said at the Transfiguration. And his whole message was, when we're at Mass, it's good for us to be here. Something like the Transfiguration, but even greater is going on here. And he really brings it out. It's really, really wonderful. And the uh, Catholic thing is free. If you just go to Catholic things, sign up, you'll start getting them every day. And you may not be able to read them every day. I can't read them every day. They're, they're wonderful, but I, just, I can't keep up. But they're, they're really wonderful. And you, it, it is free. They will ask for a donation. If you get into it, you'll find you want to donate because it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I commend that to you, particularly the one, it's good for us to be here. I'll just pass it. You can take a quick glance at that. No, no, it just comes up every day. Every day it comes up. They, he chooses. If you miss it, you can go back. I'm, I'm sure there's an archive. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can find it. I, I saw it a couple of days ago, I think. I can't hear you. Well, no, I, just put up, I think it was put up before Sunday. I mean, he had a sum. This is what he put up. Had nothing to do with him. It just happened to be a summary of what he did on Sunday. But I think 
he was asked to write it and he probably wrote it before Sunday. Does it say the date on there? I'm not sure, what's the date? March 13th. Oh, it was dated, okay, so I don't know. I don't know when it was posted, but it, it was recent. That was, I was just shocked, I was so happy to see it because I wanted to, to give that to you. All right. Um, um, I've had better starts. This has not been the easiest start in the world, but, and, and here's the problem. I had such a, last week was so darn much fun. I couldn't believe it. I got so excited about Ezekiel. I just couldn't, couldn't get over it. So this is going to be hard. I can't repeat that. Although there's one coming up, which I'll probably get to next week. That's just as informative as, as the Ezekiel one was. But one of the things I was thinking about is why, what is the, this is my opinion now, again, this is what, nothing from Father Sebastian, but I suddenly thought, why do we read Revelation? I mean, it's so weird, and it's got all this symbolism in it, we need to understand all that, and really, if you look at the, the third way to look at it, the, the futurist way, the way that so many of the, of our Protestant friends look at it, it's all about end times, and eschatology, and the symbols all mean things today, and all that sort of thing, and it gets very, very confusing. So why read it? Well, the same way came to me, it's the same thing as reading the rest of scripture. Why do we read scriptures? It was written 2000 years ago. Matthew, Mac, Mark, and Luke, and John were written to an audience 2000 years ago at a specific time in history, in an event, in a culture. And yet we read it today because it has great merit in sharing today what those people were going through because we go through those things. And I suddenly thought, what better book to read and study right now, particularly during Lent, than Revelation, because it's applicable to what we're doing today. The message John through Christ, Christ through John to the people of the seven churches of Asia Minor apply to us. We're living in a pagan society. We're beginning to become persecuted. Christians around the world are beginning to see more and more persecution and more and more need. And what's the message? Hang on. Hang on. It's going to get better. And I and I remember almost his entire pontificate, St. John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II, was always talking about the springtime of our faith. You know, he, he really, I, I think he really thought that the 20th century was really a bad century. It was filled with evil and wars and pain, all kinds of awful things. And he had this image that at the millennium, he did so much to make the millennium such a special event the whole year. And he prepared it for it for three years with, you know, one year was for the father, one year was for the son, one year was for the Holy Spirit. He gave that opportunity to go to a holy place by making a station church all over the, the world that you could go to and receive a plenary indulgence like you would if you went to a basilica in Rome. And he did all of those things to celebrate the jubilee out of the Jewish history of the Jubilee. And he sort of was indicating that the 21st, the 22nd, what are we in, 21st, 21st century um, is going to be the springtime and maybe it yet will. But I remember, and I've told you this before, I remember a homily, I'll never forget it, it was Father McAfee, it was Easter Sunday. And he was talking about the persecution under Diocletian. He was talking about the very end of the Roman persecution of the Christians and how it was so dark and everybody was being killed and there was no need in the world for anybody who wanted to become a Christian because that meant you'd be arrested and, and punished. And he said, right at that moment, um, the emperor retired and went to his farm and Constantine came in and all the rest is history. And he, rep he reminded me of flying through a cloud in an airplane. As you're climbing in an airplane and you're in a cloud, it's very dark. And then suddenly you break out on top of the cloud and there's the sun. And he talked about that. And I also know from my experience in the field, it's darkest just before dawn. If you stay up all night, I'll tell you right now, just before, before morning nautical twilight, BMNT, that's the time that it just starts getting light and then it excessively continues until the sun comes up. Just before that time, it is the darkest of the night. And that's what this is all about. That's what Revelation is all about. You're in the darkest of the night, but you don't know when the dawn is coming. 
you're in the cloud and you're lost and it's, it seems hopeless, but something great is coming. And that's what I see Revelation telling us today, because this is the darkest, in my opinion, in my lifetime. Although we had some pretty scary time in the 50s. And we all forget that, you know, when you got under our desk and protect ourselves from nuclear attack. Yeah, that, that's really going to work. That was really clever. But anyway, it gave us something to do to make us feel that we were going to survive. But we've, we, and, and I didn't live exactly through, I was born during World War II, but I didn't live through all that. So I know that was a very, very bad time. But this is the darkest it's been in my life. And things are happening, Beverly says it almost every day. Boy, our parents wouldn't believe it. They would never believe this could happen. And yet it's happening. So take heart in this message. Read Revelation and see what Christ was telling John to tell the first century Christians in Asia Minor. And use that as an applicable way to say, hang on, the finish line's around the corner. We are going to persevere. Christ is going to win. The church is going to come in the end victorious. Christ has won it. It's the, the war is over. The battle may look bad, but the war has been won. And that's the message of Revelation. So I, I just thought that would be something to, to mention. Last time we looked at, at Revelation 5, and uh, we, again, we saw things like the, the, the incense being a reflection of the prayers of the faithful, the prayers of the early Christians being raised to God. And that's, that idea is why we incense uh, all the time at church. It's really funny that now when I see Father incense the altar and, and incense the, the altar boy incenses him, and I see all that as our prayers moving around the altar. And we, we see all of the collective prayers of all of us in our private heart being offered in that beautiful physical way of incense, beautiful smelling, wonderful, visible uh, as, it's, as it's offered to God. We talked about, the, again, the seals kind of remind us of the, of the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets that were put in the, the ark, and we'll look more about that in a, in, a, in a few days. And again, he talked so much about the historical context, the lamb, uh, standing, the image of a lamb that was slain, but was standing is the image of Christ, the lamb who is standing after being slain. So he's resurrected. So we get this image. Remember the first century Christians knew the Old Testament. Most of them were Jews by, by background, not all of them, but I'm sure those who weren't had been taught a lot about Judaism uh, by the early Jewish Christians. And so this was not a new religion that came out of nowhere. This is not a new religion as some, uh, some biblical scholars have proclaimed. Bultman said, you don't even need to read the Old Testament. This is about Christianity. We're, we're new. Well, no, we are part of this. We are, our ancestors are, are the Jews and all the Old Testament. And he said, um, we saw the ecclesia, the gathering, the discussion on that, as to whether it started with the side of Christ where the, the church that we practice in the christian church began but many of the fathers saw that beginning with adam and eve and others even said no it starts with the trinity the ecclesia the people of god starts with the loving relationship in the trinity god the father god the son god the holy spirit as manifest initially with god creating human beings to be his people they failed fell the rest is history and then we finally get it move forward till we get to the crucifixion where what we now consider we are part of the church that's still the ecclesia so it could have started in any of those and again he talked about the importance of conveying to the people not to apostatize the issue is the first command and the two great pillars if you will of, of the old testament the two great e's are the exodus and the exile and they frame almost the entire Old Testament. All the stuff leading up to ending up in Egypt for 430 years and then coming out and starting and then finally failing after the kingdoms and so on and the exile and then the return. Those are the two big principal pieces of the Old Testament around which almost everything is centered. The law comes from, from um, the Exodus. The prophets is the word of God sent through individuals to proclaim 
to the leaders of Israel and Judah and the people, the word of God. So the prophecy is seen as the word of God through human form. And then, of course, that was completely fulfilled when Christ, the word of God, came in the flesh, the incarnation. So we now have the word of God as lived by a man like us in all things but sin, who walked the face of the earth for 33 years and left us this information that these writers of the gospels have put down and all the rest of the, the New Testament. The whole New Testament is a gift and testament to the presence of the living God in the flesh. So we're, we're seeing a, a lot of that. Uh, and so we must, like they, not violate the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other God, no strange gods. And it's, and it's very clear that that was the number one commandment that was violated the most in the Old Testament, resulting in the Babylonian exile. Um, and again, we're called to remain faithful, <clears throat> even if it costs our physical life, <clears throat> as they were. <clears throat> I said, remember that physical life can kill the body, but the soul is immortal. And it's the second death that you have to worry about. That's the death that could kill the soul. So don't apostatize, hang on. Even if it costs you your life, if you stay true to the faith, you will reach paradise. Um, so that's what we kind of, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, don't get, no, don't get excommunicated. Uh, we saw again in Revelation five, we saw um, Psalm 141, as I mentioned, um, we saw the altar of incense in Zechariah. Uh, we saw myriads, meaning thousands upon thousands of thousands of righteous people uh, that were in Daniel 7. We saw the four horses of victory, violence, death, and pestilence, which said to the people, it's going to get bad. It's going to get worse, but hang on. Then we saw the mark on the forehead coming from Ezekiel. Now remember Ezekiel was a prophet called on God to prophesy during the exile. He was part of the second wave. It's very important to remember that most of us, at least I always thought, oh, there's one Babylonian exile. The Babylonians came, rounded up everybody, took them out, destroyed the city and left. No, three. Three separate captures of people. First one was probably the aristocracy. They came back and they were still apostatizing, so God sent them a second time and took them. And this is when um, Ezekiel was taken. And then he's talking and prophesying about the third and final one. What is three? Complete. What was complete? The destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Judaism. Completely destroyed in the Babylonian captivity, except for the remnant. And there's always an Adoim, a group of faithful people who remain. And it's interesting in contrast. We'll mention this in a few minutes. But this but Left Behind series is just the reverse of the history. The, the, the righteous people are left behind. In the Left Behind series, the righteous people are taken up in the rapture, and everybody else is left behind. And that's when there was so much scare among their children. You go home, your mother won't be there. It's because she's been raptured. And they didn't know what to do. But it's just the opposite. So we, we know that, that story uh, of the importance of, of being part of the, of the group that remained. And there was that group that we saw, and we saw them identified in Ezekiel last week um, by having the mark placed on their forehead by the angel who was recording who would survive and who would not. And they were the ones who were upset, discouraged, frustrated about what was going on. They saw the abominations. They saw what their leaders were doing. They saw the temples the pagan gods in the temple precinct. They saw these terrible things that were part of this vision. And they were very, very upset. And those were the ones that received the mark and everyone else was destroyed or carried off in captivity. So that again encourages us, be the faithful remnant. The church will survive. Today, there's just such a almost demand in, in society and culture to give all this stuff up. I mean, how many times do you hear people say about how it's old wives' tales. It doesn't make any sense. You know, man is God, and it's all about us. The guy that collects the most toys wins, and all this nonsense. Um, and that's what we're hearing from, from that. So that's what we looked at. 
All right, today we're going to look at Revelation 8 and, and 9. For wh whatever reason, he kind of jumped over 10. I think it's just because we didn't have time. And he didn't give me a lot of information in these two either, but I wanted to go and give you a little more than was just covered because I think it's important that we get a feel. Remember, the overarching program from the class is very, very brief. We just skimmed over all of it. These are my notes taken from Father Sebastian's classes to his parish. Uh, six one-hour classes. So I've, transcribed, I've been transcribing them and then giving you that information. But chapter eight, so in chapter seven, we saw the seals and he said, uh, when the lamb, remember last week we said, who can open the seals? Who can, no one can open the seals. No one can. And remember the seals was this idea that it was a scroll and it was sealed to make sure that when you read it, nobody had messed with it. This is obviously as it was written by John, it's sealed by his signet ring or whatever. Um, there were seven seals on it because maybe each of the other, the seven letters was in a separate scroll. I don't know. We don't know. But the image is there are seven seals. Once I read that, that um, a uh, last will and testament of someone in Judaism at that time required the seal of seven independent witnesses to testify that that was true. Today, we just have a lawyer and we pay him a lot of money. So. <laughs> but the, this is what we're looking at. So we saw the only one that was eligible to, to open the seal, because John was very upset. He saw the scroll. He wouldn't know what was in it. He was weeping. No one could open it. None of the people that in the vision. And finally, they said the lamb can open it. Of course, that's Jesus. So he said, when, this, when the lamb, when Jesus opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then I saw, again, seven. Seven is a perfect Jewish number. Seven days of creation. Seven is a very, very holy number. So we see this image of seven all throughout the book of Revelation. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another, I'm going to read the whole chapter, then we'll come back. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. So again, containing incense. And he was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. So this is the image of the heavenly throne room with God and his angels. And we see seraphim and cherubim. We're seeing all these images. And we're seeing the incense of the people of the seven churches. And he said, then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. Now, remember again, the altar is outside the temple. And it's the place that animal sacrifices are made. So there's fire on it 24 hours a day. So there's coal or em, em, embers. I, I don't know what they used wood, but it'd be like charcoal. It would be like a burning piece of, of wood that's been in this fire. So he said, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. And he throws it on the earth. So this is a symbolic act, which you look at in a second. And then there were peals of thunder, loud noises, flashing and lightning and earthquakes. Now the seven angels who had seven trumpets made ready to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, which fell on the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. When you see this image, you read these images, you can think back of where there were situations like this and it comes out of Exodus. The nine plagues, there was, there was hail and there was frogs. You remember I told you the story of the frogs when the guy filled my room with little bitty frogs and he woke up with one on my face. Frogs, I know what frogs everywhere is like. It's, some guy stopped in the middle of that, we're in North Carolina, big rainstorm and he's, these guys saw thousands of frogs jumping across the road. So he went and collected a five gallon bucket filled with these little bitty frogs. And they opened our door, it was about midnight and then poured this, batch in the room and we didn't hear it the next thing i knew i woke up and there's a frog on my face frogs every all over the room it took us forever to get the frogs out of our room so i know what it's like to be overcome by small frogs but anyway you see these things so well this is what happened the first one then he said the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood a third third everything's thirds 
Ezekiel was told to take your beard and cut it up into three pieces. Beard in your hair. Part of it you cut with a sword, part of it you burn, part of it you just threw into the air. What was the references? Three deportations. Finally, after the third deportation, it was complete. So this idea of three completes. So a third, the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch and fell on the rivers. Here, remember the turning the rivers into blood and the fountains of water. And the name of the star was Wormwood, which is terrible uh, tasting, uh, almost a poison. And the third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died and the water became, was made bitter. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars. That's basically time. You measure in antiquity, they measure time with, with stars, the sun, there's a lunar calendar, there's a, a solar calendar. And he said, and a third of the light and, and, and a third of the stars so that a third of their light was darkened and a third of the day was kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked and heard an eagle care, crying with a loud voice as it flew to mid heaven, whoa, 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 to those who dwell on the earth. At the blast of the other trumpet, which the three angels were about to blow. So that's that's the there. We don't have everything, but I did want to read you some after I show you the notes. And I'll go back and read some of those for you. From Remember I told you I took the um, Ignatius Study Bible. And I, I don't know how many you, you may remember. A few years ago, Scott Hahn put out uh, a pamphlet. Well, it's more than a pamphlet, but a little booklet on each chapter, each uh, book of the Bible. So you get one on Matthew and one on Mark and one on Luke and one on John, and one on Revelation and one on the letters. And each one had these footnotes in them and there are a variety of kinds of footnotes and they have explanations, words and so on. Well, that's what the Ignatius Study Bible became. They took all of that and made it into a Bible. So the same, if you have those little individual versions of the, of the books, uh, it's the same in the study Bible. And that's what these are. They're really, really wonderful. And it just shows the scholarship that goes into it because there's an explanation for all of these images. But again, Father Sebastian didn't have time to give it all to us. But here we are. Um, he said, when the lamb opened the seven seals, this is Exodus imagery. Um, again, the seventh seal is for the seven churches. We saw in Revelation chapter four and five earlier that they were open each one. And it was all being open to the Christians of Asia Minor who were under this persecution. And the information was given to them so that they could endure, so that they could hang on. Father again said it several times about his running cross country and how you just about die and you think you're gonna die and you're convinced you're gonna die. And then suddenly you're about 200 yards from the finish line and everybody's cheering and you get a little burst and you run across and then you die. Uh, but uh, he, he mentioned that as this image that they're trying to convey. And that's that really is a powerful image that we need to hang on. You reminded us that the letters were about that, the, the, as I said, the cheers and the applause of the crowd. So again, just prior to this receiving the scrolls, that these Christians, they did they weren't sure where John was. Um, John had been kind of like their bishop or archbishop of the seven churches. Then the persecution arrested him. We didn't know what happened. Then they later learned that he was on Patmos. And then they get this scroll written from him and, and they were really excited because they, they hadn't really known what had happened to their leader. And again, they, they revealed John's persecution and the persecution of the people. And a, a reminder that, as I've said before, some may die, but you've got to remain faithful. Uh, if you remain faithful, then you'll receive eternal life, second death. So again, at this point, they find the lamb, open the seven seal, this period of silence, and we're reminded again of the repetition of seven. And he said, some scholars have suggested that these repetitions where you go from maybe, you go from the angels and then you go for the trumpets, and then you go from the bowls and you go, that this repetition of seven is like a spiral, that it just gives you a little bit more information about the same topic. Some see it as different topics, many see it as just a continuation and expansion of the same story. Um, so right after we saw the angels do it, we hear the trumpets. It appears that the fourth, this is the fourth telling of the story. And again, uh, we see the importance of seven from Genesis, which is a creation story. 
chapter one and two, which is the story of creation in seven days. So again, that's where the beginning of the importance of seven. He said, we hear then uh, about the instance of prayer. And we again saw that in Revelation four and five. There's, we saw the bowls of incense, the golden bowls, seven. And they contain the, the prayers offered to God from the saints. And again, saints in this context is always the people, the Christian people of the early church. It's not people in heaven. And that will come later. So these were God's holy people. They were the, they the ones that God was taking care of. And again, some are dead and some are still alive, but hang on. And those who have died as martyrs under the persecution, we're going to see an image of them under the altar in heaven. And they're crying out. We see that image of them crying out for vengeance. And they're told, just be calm, be patient, it's coming. And again, going back to Daniel, remember the, the empires. They're in Babylon, the people that are, that while this is, uh, they were in Babylon when, when Daniel was written. And while Ezekiel was written, they were in Babylon. Babylon was beaten by the Persians. The Persians were beaten by the Greeks. The Greeks were defeated by the Romans. Now, the first century Jew, Jews and Christians know that history, and they know they're at the fifth part of that story. And the fifth part of that story is the Roman Empire will be defeated by a stone not cut by human hands, which will come and destroy the statue or destroy the empire. The Roman Empire will fall to this little stone, which becomes this great mountain, which is the church. And that's what they're conveying. They know the story from Daniel. They know where they are in the story of Daniel. They know they're under the, the fourth beast. And they know that that's about to be destroyed. So that's knowing that makes this all the more acceptable. Uh, so some, uh, again, th those who've died martyrs, we'll see, and they'll be crying for vengeance. And, and John tells them to be patient. At this point, the prayers have risen, and there's going to be vengeance. In a certain sense, God, God is answering the, this request that we saw first requested in Revelation 5. So here are the arrival of the seven trumpets. And then there's fire from the censer and heaven being dumped upon the earth. And next, John tells us about the seven trumpets. And again, as I said, some of it see it uh, as uh, new information. Others see it as the same information taught in a different way. He said that's very biblical where they tell a story in a different way, one right after the other. Now, we're going to see again the emphasis we saw as we read that uh, of one third, one third of the seas, one third of the stars. That goes again back to the image of Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 2. So Ezekiel said in chapter 5, and you, O son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a barber as a barber's razor and then pass it over your head and your beard and take balances for weighing and divide the hair a third part you shall burn in fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are complete a third part you shall take and strike with a sword round about the city and a third part you shall scatter to the wind and and i will be unsheathed the sword after them and they shall take the from these a small number and bind them um in the skirts of your robe and so on can you imagine this guy walking around the city cutting his hair off and cutting his beard off and dividing it into three parts but it's this image this image of threes and again if you know that then when you see this third it makes sense to the first century christians that's what they're talking about he was disposing of his hair in that way. And this was depicting the three ways that the unrighteous people are going to die. Fire and sword and pestilence. So you're going to, he's prophesying what's going to happen to those persecutors of them in the first century. Ezekiel again um, was in Babylon at the second deportation. And then the third wouldn't be complete. And it was in the third in 587 that temple was destroyed. Now you've got to remember the destruction of the temple. Because when we go a little bit further forward in Revelation, we're going to see New Testament prophecies about the destruction of the temple again. 
Now, if this was written in the 90s, these people had already witnessed that. If it was written earlier, they may not have, but it, I think it was written in the 90s, which means they knew that these messages we'll look at in a, in a second are relating to what happened to the Temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans. And this is just unfathomable. The, the, the people of Israel, after witnessing the temple being destroyed in 587, waiting 500 years for the Messiah to come back, who they missed, hoping the glory cloud would come back, which they missed, which did happen, if you understand Christianity, in Christ. And then it was going to be destroyed again. And Jesus even prophesied to that effect. So often we don't realize that when you do the passion, One of the stations of the cross, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. What's that all about? Why is it there? What does Jesus say? They are weeping. They are crying. Their Messiah is being killed by the Romans. And what does he say? Don't weep for me. Weep for you and your children. We'll see that. I'll look at him. Also, he told the disciples, he said, oh, isn't this temple magnificent? Look what Herod is doing. This is the most beautiful place in the whole world. Not a stone will stand on a stone in 40 years, in one generation, generation of 40 years, in 40 years. This was 33. It was destroyed in 40, I mean, in 70. I mean, that's not an accident. And the temple was destroyed once and for all. And that was the end of Judaism, as it was, because it should have been replaced by the Jews to the new Judaism, which is Christianity. And those who didn't see it are still waiting to rebuild the third temple. It's just really, it's really amazing. But anyway, he's talking about Ezekiel's visions, and that means the, the complete and total destruction. All right, let me just read you a couple of notes from, from the Bible, from the, um, what the heck happened here? Okay. All right, so it says, uh, eight, eight verse one, silence. Silence in heaven. This recalls the liturgical silence that fell over the Jerusalem temple when the priest offered incense and the multitude of prayers quietly in the outer court. That's in the morning and the evening. Morning, there's a, an animal being sacrificed, a lamb being sacrificed on the altar burnt offering outside the temple while the priest is offering the incense prayers of the people inside twice a day. So he said that silence is what was happening. It was very quiet during that time. Jewish traditions speaks of the angelic silence in heaven when Israel prays and when the judgment of God are about to fall. And he gives a quote for every one of these things from the Bible. Here an angel offers prayers of the saints with incense just before the curse descends upon the earth. Verse two, the seven angels, seven archangels ministered uh, in the presence of God according to scripture. The Jewish tradition, which names them, which I had never seen before. I know uh, Raphael, Michael and Gabriel, but they, they shows a Uriel, uh, U-R-I-E-L, Raphael, Regel, R-A-G-U-E-L, Michael, Sarakwell, Gabriel, and Ramil. And he said that's from one Enoch. And they're known as the angels of the Lord's present. So again, Old Testament. 8-3, prayers of all the saints. Like the priests on earth, the angels in heaven are liturgical ministers as well as covenant mediators between God and his people. They were vested like priests, according to um, Revelation 15, 6. And here they offer as incense the petition of the faithful. The company of all the saints probably included those in heaven, and, such as the martyrs and the multitudes who praise God for his mercy and plead in the judgment of the wicked. The communion of saints is based on, is the basis for the intercession of, of the saints, just as we are faithfully pray for one another on earth, so the faithfully departed pray for us as they look down from heaven. So that's the image that we're getting there, according to Scott Hahn. Golden altar is a heavenly counterpart to the altar of incense. In verse five, he said, they threw it upon the earth. It's an act of divine judgment. The gesture recalls Ezekiel two, where the heavenly messenger scatters burning coals over Jerusalem. Seven, uh, again, the seven trumpet blasts of the earth are the sevenfold judgments. Wormwood's the name of a bitter plant that symbolizes the sorrow and distaste of human affection. 
said, whoa, 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 is the prophetic warning of the judgment about to rain down upon sinners. So that's a little bit more than we just got from Father Sebastian um, concerning chapter 8. What happened to chapter 9? Okay, so now we'll read chapter 9. Just so much in this. All right, and so now the fifth angel blew his trumpet and saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth and was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened and the smoke was from the shaft. And then the smoke came locusts. I remember locusts as a child. We had a plague of locusts, I think in the 50s or something. We get the cicada all the time. They don't do anything. Locusts eat everything. It's terrible. So why are we there? So then he said, from the smoke came locusts and the earth, and they were given power like the power of a scorpion on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree, but only those of mankind who have not the seal upon their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months and not to kill them. And the torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings. I, rem I remember, I was right. I wrote Beverly a letter one time that dealt with this. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm in very little contact. It's not, it's not really dangerous over here, but, but the bugs are about to kill me. <laughs> I, I um, walking through the jungle, we knocked a, a red, red ant nest and it, all the red ants fall on you. And they, they, they sting like you can't believe. Then a kid, knocked over a bee's nest and he was inflamed in bees and thank goodness one of the kids was a farmer and he popped a smoke grenade and had the guy get in the smoke to get the bees off of him but he must have had a hundred stings we had to evacuate well that night i did i had ended up after the red ants um, i was eating a piece of cheese beverly had sent me one of those swiss things that have ten, ten fold around them they're in a circle and you take each little square out so i was eating that and a black ant got on it I didn't see it he got on my tongue and he just clamped down on my tongue this big black ant and the next thing I knew, I'm getting ready to get under my poncho liner and something felt, it just felt moist. Just like you, if you wet your finger and just run it across, just ran across my arm and then all hell broke loose. So I think it was a scorpion. I think I got stung by a scorpion that night. I said, you know, I'm, I'm not in any danger of getting shot, but these bugs are, about to, they're, they're just killing me. So I, I know what a scorpion kind of feels like if that's what it was. Huh? So anyway, it makes sense. Okay, so we get the locust and then the scorpion. And he said, and they were told to harm the grass, uh, except that it was the, the, the seal in their forehead. And they were allowed to torture them for five months, but not kill them and torture them and the scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death will fly from them. And the appearance of the locusts were like horses arrayed for battle. And on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. That's a lot on a little scorpion. <laughs> I mean, that's a locust. We're talking about a little locust here. They had scales of iron on the breastplate, and, and the noise of their wings was like the rushing in battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and the sting of their power of hurting men for five months it lies in their tails. And they have a king over them, and angels in the bottomless pit, and the name of Hebrew is Abaddon, in the Greek it was called Ap Apollyon, and the first woe was to pass, behold, two woes were still to come. That's bad enough. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, uh, and I heard a voice from the four horns, the golden altar, remember the altar was this barbecue pit outside, it was, it was raised, you would have a ramp that goes up to it, but there were four, there was a horn on each corner, of the altar. So that's the horns of the altar. That was just the way it was built. So you, you see that image. And he said, um, lost my place. The horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had a trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the gate of the Euphrates. So four angels were released who had been held <coughs> ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of mankind. Again, one third number. The number of the, of the troops of Calvary was twice 10,000 
times 10,000. And I heard their number. And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates of color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And their heads of the horses were like lion's heads and the fire, smoke and sulfur issued from their mouths. But these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed and the fire and smoke and sulfur issued from their mouths for the power of the horse is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents with their head and, the, and by means of them, they wound. 20, verse, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor giving worship, worship of demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot either see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality of their fists. So this is the image in nine, which is quite extensive. So again, Father only covered one through three and then 20. But he said, this is interesting because I wanted to share this with you uh, rather quickly. There are, there are more, but there are two predominant uh, Protestant scholars, Protestant Bible scholars who wrote extensively, wrote books about the apocalypse and revelation being about end times. And one of them was uh, Hal Lindsey. And he was a TV personality and author. And he wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, where he describes the locusts as modern helicopters. And he actually goes in and describes the components of the helicopter as reference to these components we saw in the planet. And I mean, I mean again, it's, it's very possible that this is all about end times. I don't know. But I like kind of the way we're looking at it better. But that was one of the things that he did. He also wrote a book called the Apocalypse, called Apocalypse Code, which described the book of Revelation in terms of it being end time Armageddon. The world is coming in, the big battle in Armageddon, which is uh, over on the coast of, of uh, Israel. Um, and then he wrote uh, a, another author who was very familiar with Hal Lindsey, this guy named Tim LaHaye, who's the one you know, wrote the Left Behind series. And he was very successful. And he wrote all kinds of, they made movies of it. And this whole idea of, the, of being Jesus is coming back and there's going to be a rapture and the righteous people are going to take it up into heaven on the cloud. And he took several passages of New Testament, sort of combined them. Father said, put them in the blender and spun them around and they came out with this. But it, he wrote the Left Behind series. But the one I wanted to commend you, and Father's talked about this guy before and I never had time to read it. But his name is Hank Hennergraff. He's Dutch, but he's an American. He's an evangelical radio personality. And he wrote the book called The Apocalypse Code. And I pulled it down, put it on my Kindle and read the whole thing. I was fascinated. If you want to read a very good detailed explanation of this way of studying um, in its historical context, the book of Revelation, he's done it. And in his book, he tries very, very hard to refute the previous two guys. And he points out kind of the fallacy of their argument using the preterist method, which is what we're doing, which is putting in context. Um, Father was extremely uh, commended with this. And this is the book, it's called The Apocalypse Code. And it's a very easy read. I found it fascinating. I found it, I, I don't usually read these kinds of books, but I, I really enjoyed it. And I didn't realize until later that this was another evangelical Protestant. I think he was a minister initially. He later became, I don't, I th he may become yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Back in the, when, when we were children, you know, centuries ago, <laughs> last century. But anyway, I commend that to you because I, I, I really, I finally broke down and got it and I was fascinated with it. All right, in 20, the Father reminded us the four cycles of seven uh, are rever referring us back to Leviticus 26.18. Leviticus 26.18 says, and if in spite of this, you will not hearken to me, then I will chastise you again sevenfold. So again, this image of seven. I will, I'll chastise you again sevenfold for your sins. So we hear this cycle of chastisement. Sevenfold because the people had broken the covenant required them to worship the one true God. When they came out of Egypt, the plan was them to worship the one true God and have no other gods. And if they do that, if they do have other gods, then they break the covenant and they'll no longer be under God's protection. And that's exactly what happened as the kings came. 
The whole history of the 20 kings of the north all worship pagan gods, and most of the kings of the south worship pagan gods, and even one of the kings in the south offered animal sac uh, human sacrifices of his own children to one of the gods. This is a king of Judah. So this is part of our culture and history as well. Here in Revelation, we continue to see God's people, ones in Asia Minor, being tempted to apostatize and or even feign apostasy. So it'd be easier. Oh, don't you think you could just write a, light a little candle to Caesar's statue of Caesar? You're not really violating. You're not really worshiping. Just go along with it. You can't feign apostasy. And this is what we're seeing, the temptation. Again, the book written in the late 90s, they had determined that Caesar was a god. At this point, we're beginning to see Caesar worship as part of the Roman religious culture, and it was demanded, and it was insisted upon. And it produces a tremendous problem. He said the polytheists have no problem. Polytheists will worship anything. So if they want to add the Caesars, that's fine. We'll just add that to the list. But for the Christian, this creates a, a tremendous problem. So that meant if they refused, they were breaking the Roman law. And this problem is discussed in, by Paul earlier in Romans 2 and 3 about how the Christians are being called to worship the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. And yet they were part of the Roman Empire and they were being persecuted for this. And so he said, the rest of mankind who were killed by these plagues did not repent. Again, we see in Leviticus uh, verse 21, Leviticus 26, 21. He said, then if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken to me, I will bring more plagues upon you sevenfold as many as your sins. So we're seeing this historical remembrance back to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, which is the, basically the, the way to worship God uh, as being reflected in these issues. Father pointed out that this, this echo of 26, Christians who were not repenting were to receive these plagues, the, the plagues of Egypt, the plagues of other prophecies. And they had heard about those plagues. They knew that they weren't as foreign as they are to us. When we hear these kinds of things, we think, well, that's really weird. But to them, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what happened to those people. And he said the further, he, further he said the Greek word being translated as mankind uh, really uh, it simply meant that the rest of those not killed by the plagues had not re repented of the works of their hands. So it goes back and speaks of these idols of gold and silver, and that should remind us of the condemnation from Ezekiel and Jeremiah as they discussed the, the sin of idolatry. Here we have this historical context. We see this Christians of Asia Minor being tempted, and they're being called to stand fast. John calls them not to give in, patiently endure, the finish line's around the corner. The dawn is coming. And the book was written, if it was written the last year of Domitian, as he mentioned, that meant you were supposed to worship Domitian as a god. And Domitian was the last guy before this particular part of the persecution broke. So it was a very short period of time between when this letter was written and when the persecution ended. But it was a very painful time for the Christians at that point. So again, from the notes from chapter nine, okay, the overall, I said the fifth trumpet unlocks the abyss, releasing volcanic smoke and swarms of warrior locusts and their demonic forces let loose to torture and terrorize the earth. Four restrictions are placed on the first woe. Vegetation is to be left unharmed. Only the wicked are to be targeted for torment. The victims are not to be killed. And the plague is to end in five months. He said the limitations such as these suggest that God is administering a remedial or corrective, corrective punishment. And it's not aimed at bringing about total repentance. The prophet Joel once described the invasions of locusts. And that these locusts overran the whole country of Judah in Old Testament times. As John vision 
he corrupts them, uh, compared them to an army of war horses when the lions, with lion's teeth and wings that sound like chariots. This too was a plague from the Lord intended to induce repentance. Verse one, he said, the star is fallen. That means a demon, this is really interesting, a demon or fallen angel. This is the image of Lucifer. And he said, um, the bottomless pit or the abyss, which corresponds to the Hebrew word shoal or Hades in Greek. By the way, that's the place of the dead. And if you remember, there's an interesting parable that Christ gives about shoal. Because we think of heaven being open before this heaven was not open. So people who died went to shoal. But Jesus tells the story of, of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, the poor man, beggar, sores all over him. The dogs came out and licked his wounds. He was sitting in broken pottery and just miserable guy. And this rich guy walks by him every day and pays no attention to him, just, just ignores him. And then Lazarus dies. And he is taken up to what's called the bosom of Abraham in Shoal. And then the rich man dies. And he's in the other part of Shoal. And he's in torment and fire and he's very very tormented and he calls out he sees abraham and he sees lazarus and he said father abraham i'm burning up down here i'm i need some water can you send lazarus down just have him touch his finger in water and just put it on my tongue and abraham says this is jesus parable he said there's an abyss between us and no one from here can come there and no one from there can come here and you had every opportunity to take care of him in life and you didn't and then he says well well, since I'm here, why don't you send Lazarus back to my hometown and tell my brothers, tell my brothers about what I'm in suffering. And Abraham says, even if someone was to rise from the dead, your brothers will not believe. And that's exactly about Jesus Christ. So again, this image, even then, there was two parts of Hades, the righteous part and the unrighteous part. And Christ made it quite clear that you couldn't go from one to the other. So I just thought that was an interesting image that he, he portrays there. Um, okay. It says, whoa, 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 is a warning of a judgment about to rain down on the sinners. Oh, I talked about the locusts. Okay. Um, again, the stars falling, the abyss, Shoal and Hades, and it's in cosmology of, of Israel. This is the gloomy underworld where the spirits of men um, sink down after death and await for final judgment. It's also the dwelling of the eternal spirits, they crawl upon up to bring death, destruction, and deception into the world of the living. Christ had authority over this realm because he holds the keys to the abyss and can order angels and demons to lock or unlock at his decision. Uh, for the seal of God marked the protection of the righteous of Israel. Five months, roughly equivalent to the cycle of an actual locust. Didn't know that. But anyway, that's some images of. Uh, of chapter 9. We'll look at beginning of chapter 11 because we didn't cover 10. He just didn't cover 10 at all. So I don't really want to go. Chapter 11, he said, it, I was then given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar of those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple and leave that out for it's given over to the nation's and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. Guess how long 42 months is? Three and a half years. Guess how long the siege of Jerusalem lasted? Three and a half years. Can you believe it? That's exactly what happened. And I will grant my two witnesses power and prosperity for 1,200 and 60 days cloth clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from the mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, uh, thus he has doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky and no rain may fall during the days uh, of their prophesying. And they have the power to over waters and over blood and to smite the earth and every plague and often as they desire. And they have the finished their testimony. The beast that ascended from the bottomless pit will make war upon them and conquer them and kill them. 
and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city. This is exactly what happened in Jerusalem. Well, I, I, I wrote, a, I wrote, a, I produced a little talk where I went and got a historical explanation of that end of that war, this seven year war, and then the destruction of Jerusalem. Boy, when they, when the Romans finished the slaughter, there were people just everywhere. There was no one to bury the dead. It was amazing. So a great city, and the archeologically called Sodom and Egypt. Those are two really bad cities in the Old Testament. What are you talking about here at Jerusalem? Yeah, they did eat their children. They, there was a, right at the beginning of the siege, they had a disagreement between two camps of Jews in the city under siege, and they went and burned each other's storeroom. So they ran out of food very quickly. And they couldn't get in the, the Romans. This is what this is what I think is beginning to happen in, in Ukraine. I think the Russians surround the city and cut off all food supplies. The people are going to starve, and that's exactly what the Romans did. He said, um, "Their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, and allegorically called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified." So we know it's Jerusalem. For three days and a half, men from the people and tribes and tongues and nations gazed upon the dead bodies and refused to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because of the two prophets had been tormented to those who dwell on the earth. And after the three and a half days, breath of life, God entered them. They stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice of heaven said, come up hither. And in the sight of their foes, they went up to heaven in a cloud. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave the glory of God. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24. The second woe passed. Behold, a third woe was soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There was a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to thee, O God Almighty, who art and who wert, who has taken the great power and begun the reign. The nation raged, but the wrath came at the time of the dead to be judged for rewarding the servants of the prophets and saints and for those who fear thy name, both small and great, and for the destroying and the destroyers of the earth. I'm going to stop with verse 19 because that's where I want to pick up next week, chapter 11, verse 19. So let's just look at the highlights of chapter 11 and then we'll be done. All right, again, Father pointed out that there are many references to help us identify this problem. Ezekiel 41 through 5 um, talks about it. Ezekiel 40. I got so many bookmarks, I can't find anything. Um, in the 25th year of our exile, the beginning of the year, the 10th of the month, 14th day of the year, we talked about this. On that day, the Lord was upon me in the vision. And that's what we saw. He took him to Jerusalem and saw what was happening. So the passage reminds us of Ezekiel's vision of going to Jerusalem and seeing all the apostasy. Many places in the Old Testament prophets were asked to measure the temple. And they were often asked to measure it before it was destroyed. And sometimes they were offered to measure it after it was being rebuilt. So this image is, is from Ezekiel. Uh, is an image of the destruction uh, and also one of preservation and restoration. Here, John is telling us about both. The temple of Jerusalem be destroyed, and then there will be the heavenly temple in heaven. Father asked that the temple um, of God, who is the temple of God in Joan, Joanine literature? Who did John refer to when he talked about the temple? When he's talking about the temple in Revelation, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. The temple in the Gospel of John was Jesus, a theme presented over and over. In John 37, through 39, he describes the pouring of water. Remember, he's on the Mount of, of Olives during the Feast of, of um, Tabernacles. And that's when they pour water all over the altar to cleanse it once a year. And he's there and he said, anyone who thirsts can come to me. He's the temple. He's telling the people of Israel that I am the new temple. And Jesus refers to himself as the rock, the foundation stone. Peter and Paul talk about Jesus as the cornerstone of the new temple. And he talks about us as being bricks in the construction of the new Jerusalem. So all this imagery is reflected here. Court of Gentiles, the city of Jerusalem, and as I said, trampled by the Gentiles, that was the Romans, three and a half years. The same time that was predicted in Daniel 7, verse 2, 
Daniel 7, verse 2, it says, Daniel said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. And then we saw the, the four images that are upstairs. And, and, and Ezekiel does the same. I mean, Ezekiel does the same thing. So Daniel speaks of the great battle, which is between the saints of God or Christians will be persecuted by the fourth beast, but then they, they will inherit the kingdom. It's the finish line is right around the corner. Revelation 4 and 5, he talks about again, 70 AD, it was surrounded three and a half years. The conclusion of this people, the Gentiles were trampling all over the city. It's true, it's the, the true temple is Jesus. He was not injured. Now the Eusebius, the bishop uh, in in um, the 12th century, in the fourth century, shows how Jesus predicted this. So I want to just share this for a moment. You've heard this so many times, but I can't read the whole thing. Matthew 24 is amazing. Jesus left the temple and was going away when the disciples came and pointed out the building and the temple. He answered them, You see all this, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will be not one, not left here one stone upon another and will not be thrown down. As I sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and saying, tell us when this will be and what will be the sign of your coming in the course, close of age. And Jesus answered him, take heed, no one leads you astray for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you will hear the wars and rumors of wars, and you will see alarm. For mo this must take place before the, before the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine and earthquake in various places. All of this is but the beginning of the suffering. And they will deliver you up to tribulation, and the death you will be uh, and and in death you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many with false prophets will arise and lead many astray and become wickedness and multiple. Most men love will grow cold, but, it, but he who endures until the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world and the testimony of all nations. Then the end will come. And basically he goes on. This, and he even, he even says, this is, so when we see desolation, Sacrilege spoken by the prophet Daniel standing at the holy place. This is the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ was not prophesying the end of the world. You can see that in the end of the world. Yeah, we always look at that. And there is some eschatology there. But this story was Christ presenting to the, to the apostles that this temple that Herod is still working on hasn't even finished will be destroyed. It's, it's truly amazing time. Okay. Not a single Christian died in Jerusalem. They took this to heart. When they saw the Roman army surrounding, when they saw these signs, when Jesus goes on and said, you know, don't even go back. If you're in the field, don't go back. Don't go get your jacket. If hopefully your wife isn't pregnant, shouldn't hope, let's hope it doesn't happen in wintertime. If that's the end of the world, who would care? But if it's the destruction of Jerusalem, you would. So that's what it's about. That's what that message is. And this is what he's saying. And, and we're going to see that. So where did they go? They went to Pella, right here. So they got out of Jerusalem. And they got to Pella. All the Christians, every, according to the records, every single Christian left Jerusalem before the Roman siege. It's just, just truly amazing. So anyway, I've got to stop. But anyway. We'll pick up there, but I can't wait to... The next passage in Revelation that we'll pick up next week, it's not as good as Ezekiel, but it, well, it's better than Ezekiel. It's about somebody else. Okay. I'll just zip down to the end. I don't have any, many more slides to go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Glorious St. Raymond of Penfort, wise and holy patron, 
come to the aid of those entrusted to your care, to all to flee to your protection. Intercede for us in our need. Help us through your prayers, example, and teaching. To proclaim the truth of the gospel to all we meet. And when we've reached the fullness of our years, we beseech you to guide us home to heaven, to live in peace with you, our Mother Mary, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary, friend of Christians, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>